I'm here at the British Hair and Nail Society Hair Educational Session in Glasgow, We're speaking with Dr. Vicky Jo Liffey. I just have three questions for you on your talk about cosmetic management of alopecia. Firstly, what do you think is the role of cosmetic products in hair disorders? I think it's an incredibly important role. I think as dermatologists and individuals interested in managing patients with hair loss, most of us really probably don't engage with it enough or don't know enough about the products and what's out there to help. But actually one of the great things about a cosmetic is it gives you an instant result. Yeah. And one of the problems that we have as doctors treating hair loss is that very often things may take six, nine months, a year to give any visible difference, whereas with a cosmetic you can get a sort of instant wow and an instant mm. lift. And I think they're incredibly important and a part of the armamentarium which we have for managing hair loss. Mm. Brilliant. And so the second question is, what is the single best styling product, would you say, on the market? So that's a really difficult question. All you have to do is Google styling products for fine hair and you'll find you've got, you know, an enormous long list. So yeah. I think like in everything in life, one chooses a few favourites. Yeah. For me, I'd say that most of my patients will leave my consulting room with two products, really, a keratin fibre, a shake on keratin fibres, which are cheap give a fantastic result for volume and giving the illusion of volume for fine or thinning hair. Yeah. And the other product which I really like is, is, a, is a product from Batiste called Plump Powder XXL and it's good value, it's cheap, shake it in, it's like a little dry shampoo really and it just gives a lot of oomph and both of those products are ch cheap, freely available and really make a fantastic difference. Brilliant. And then the last one is what is the best advice you can give for camouflage? So I think I would say is take your time try lots of different things and find out what works for you. Mm -hmm. There are a number of camouflage products, some of them are powders, some of them are sprays, and really it's a question of personal preference. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, most of the product ranges are with, in a fairly affordable range, and so it's actually quite reasonable to just go in and try them. Larger boot, branches of boots, for example, will have quite a few of the products available, or they're available online. Mm -hmm. And just simply try things until you've found what works for your lifestyle and the sort of look you have. But there is no shame in using a cosmetic camouflage most of us do for various reasons, be it cosmetics for the face or, yeah. or whatever. So just extending that into the hair or for yeah. around the brows and lashes is, is really important. Brilliant. Thank you very much. really enjoyed your talk this morning. Just want to ask you a few more questions just to recapitulate really. What, yep, okay. what do we mean by a telogen effluvium? Okay, so the hair is constantly cycling between an anadem or a growth phase and the telogen or falling out phase. And usually at any one time, about 80 to 90% is in anadem or growth phase, right. and about 10 to 20% in telogen. But in telogen effluvium, some trigger comes and moves much more of the hair into the telogen or the falling out phase. And this is manifest as increased shedding or increased right. hair loss. And what, what are the common reasons why that might happen that you see in your practice? Okay, so there are a number of reasons that cause it. So, for example, postpartum, so about three months after childbirth, people might notice increased shedding. Right. Other causes increase stress, include stress, um, life events like bereavement, divorce, weddings. Uh, diet can cause uh, increased hair loss, as can um, uh, Sorry, surgery or right. uh, illness, and also seen with a number of different commonly prescribed drugs. Right, thank you. So, quite a lot of causes, really. Yeah. How do you go about managing this problem in your practice? So, first of all, I'll establish that it is a telogen effluve and nothing else going on, so I'll we'll carry out a number of uh, blood tests. Right. Obviously, take a thorough history to see if there are any potential triggers, um, and then correct any abnormalities. Otherwise, just reassure patients that their hair will make a full recovery. And is there a role for stimulants like minoxidil, for example, with this condition? Yeah, so sometimes I will use or recommend minoxidil. Uh, usually this is used for you know, patent hair loss, and occasionally you can unmask a telogen effluve and can unmask a patent hair right. loss. So I usually recommend a 5% uh, minoxidil, usually the foam, which tends to be a bit less irritant than the lotion. And, and obviously explaining to people that they're not going to lose all their hair is quite an important yeah, aspect abso here. Absolutely. Yes. So hair generally makes a full recover it's a non-scarring form of alopecia so the hair generally will grow back sometimes it can take about six to nine months right but um, the important thing is not to stress because this can make it worse sure. thank you very much indeed all right I'm here speaking with Dr. Nilla Fafajo uh, at the BHNS uh, hair education session in Glasgow. I just have uh, five questions for you. The first is, what is hair transplantation? 
Well, hair transplantation is a surgical procedure uh, and it's usually done for male or female pattern hair loss or balding. Um, but there's lots of other reasons why people with hair loss um, may um, need hair replacing in areas where they've lost it. And basically what you're doing is taking hair from around the back and the sides of the head and putting them into balding areas on the top. Um, and it's done uh, by doctors under su surgical um, procedures with local anaesthetic. Great. Um, what would you say, what types of hair loss conditions should someone consider surgery for? Right, so the, the main one is uh, genetic hair loss or balding, but things like scarring hair loss. So someone who has accident scars, burn scars for example, and some people who have um, dermatology uh, conditions that cause hair loss can be suitable for hair transplantation as well. So would, would you say everyone is suitable? Absolutely not. Um, the, the main thing is that you have a limited resource that you can use um, to transfer fr hair from one place to another. So you're not making any extra hair. So if there's a big mismatch between the donor hair and where you're placing the, the, the grafts, then you can maybe can't accomplish uh, a good result. Right, and um, can women have surgery? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, probably about 50% of the women that I see are suitable um, for hair transplant surgery. Um, they do usually have less donor hair available, so it's usually a smaller area that we can treat, but um, definitely women are absolutely suitable, but not just for scalp hair. So we do a lot of work for women who've lost eyebrows, women who've had facelifts and their hairline has been pulled back. So there's lots of other things anywhere on your body, basically, yeah. that yeah. you normally would have hair, you can move it from one place to another. Interesting. Um, is surgery available on the NHS? Sometimes, yes. So if the hair loss is due to a medical condition or it's due to a, a trauma, like a car accident, etc., um, then you can apply for funding. Um, quite a few transgender patients um, have applied su successfully for funding and you go through your GP and they, they would know the process for applying for that sort of thing. The problem with the current technique for hair transplantation is that it's a very lengthy procedure. So it's not usually um, offered within the NHS hospitals. So you have to go to someone privately, but it doesn't mean that you can't get the funding from your local trust to pay for that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for a really informative talk. Just, I'd like to just cover a few things just to recapitulate some of the points that you made. What, what is alopecia areata? So alopecia areata is a hair loss disorder um, that can affect people in different ways, sometimes just from a patch to complete hair loss, alopecia totalis, or complete body loss, uh, or body hair and scalp hair, alopecia universalis. And we think that it's autoimmune in its origin, uh, meaning it's owned your own body attacking its own hair follicles. But we also are now learning a lot more about the role of the white cell count, the lymphocytes in um, alopecia areata, and that's exciting for the future in terms of treatments. Yes, absolutely. What, what is new in the field of alopecia areata? So I think the big news really with alopecia areata is the emergence of JAK inhibitors um, and JAK inhibitors are a small molecule drug which target um, one of the four Janus kinases which are chemicals uh, important in the pathogenesis or disease process of alopecia areata. Um, they're showing real promise. I think we just need to be a little bit careful that we are thinking about um, how we would choose which patients would be suitable for JAK inhibitors and then that way by doing that um, we can think about about uh, minimising side effects in people in whom they may not work and also making it more cost effective for the NHS. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah. what, what do you think we really need moving forward? Yeah. So I think that at the moment what we're lacking is really large scale clinical trials that will tell us the information that we need to know about existing treatments and also about the new emerging treatments like JAK inhibitors. I think with large scale trials where we can invite lots of patients to participate we can get real 
realistic numbers as to who in whom these treatments will work um, and therefore make a case for getting these on the NHS. Absolutely and yeah. certainly historically it's been a big problem for lots of treatments for alopecia areata hasn't it that we've it got has. a very poor and in, in, in inadequate base of yeah. evidence for this so it has and also I think that really what we haven't asked before is what do the patients want out of a treatment? Yes I mean the priority setting partnership which is something that you've been very heavily involved in and what is their, their main drive coming from the patients in terms of what yeah. they want? So the priority setting partnership we had around about 950 participants including both clinicians, doctors and also lots and lots of patients or almost 80% were patients and they were interested in knowing um, how alopecia first starts, uh, what might predict how things are going to go in alopecia areata and also key things like treatment efficacy, yes. um, so successor treatments so including immunosuppressants. So thank you very much, that's yeah. a really important piece of work which will hopefully guide things moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully. Thank you very much. So I'm here with Dr Anita Tukwali at the BHNS Hair Educational Meeting in Glasgow. I just have four questions for you about your talk. The first is, what are scarring alopecias? Now, scarring alopecias, Rose, are, and this word scar means when the inflammation affects the hair follicle, it's completely destroyed. So the important bit about these alopecias is their hair will not grow back. Right. So it's very imp important to recognize these conditions yeah. very early on yeah. so you can save your hair. Thank you. So um, the second question is, what is important to recognize uh, in these types of alopecia? And as, as I said before, they, they mimic other forms of alopecia. And by alopecia is a broad term, which is hair loss. And if they are not diagnosed, they could mimic any other forms of alopecia. And by the time you come to know about it, it may be too late. Yeah. They present, they can present either as a bald patch, yeah. but more often there is a lot of inflammation around these and there's a lot of symptoms. Yeah. And it's important to recognize that early intervention is vital. Brilliant. Um, can these conditions be cured? Cure is very difficult, but we aim as hair specialists to try to control them yeah. because we want to prevent further hair loss and permanent yeah. hair damage. Yeah. Um, what type of treatments are then available to people? So the treatments vary. After we've done a diagnostic clear biopsy and understood which type of hair loss or which type of scarring it is, yeah. the types of treatment vary with local treatment, yeah. keeping that area free yeah. of any germs, yeah. antiseptics, and then treating with either anti-inflammatory antibiotics, in some occasions steroid tablets, yeah. or more complex immune suppressant tablets, which are predominantly need a lot of monitoring. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time, Thank Anita. You. Thank you. I'm here with Dr. Paul Farrant um, at the British Hair and Nail Society's Hair Education Session in Glasgow. I just have four questions for you, Paul. Um, the first is, what is pattern hair loss? Uh, so pattern hair loss is what some of us will talk about in terms of balding. So in men, uh, you sort of thin in the bitemporal areas, so you get recession there. You might get recession over the crown and then it mm. thins over the top. I think what people don't recognise is that women also go thin, uh, mm. but they tend to thin more diffusely over the top of the head. So they tend to keep the hairline, but mm. they may go pretty thin behind it. So that's what pattern hair loss is. Cool, thank you. Um, so what would you say causes it in men and women? Okay, so um, we know it runs in families, so strong family history of men, you know, if your dad's bald, mm. you may well end up getting bald. And we know that genetics drives it, um, and we know certain genes are responsible, in particular men, uh, mm. on the X chromosome. Um, but actually, we don't understand all the genes, we only understand about 40% of the genes mm. that are relevant so far those genes cause the growing structure, the follicle, to become smaller and we call that miniaturization. Mm -hmm. So this bit that we have that we all cherish yeah. is actually fairly inert but it's the product of this amazing structure underneath the surface called a follicle. Mm -hmm. And that follicle, if it's a nice healthy big follicle, produces a nice big thick hair. Yeah. Uh, if it's a tiny weedy follicle, um, you produce a tiny hair fibre mm. and you can change from nice big thick hair follicles to smaller ones and that process is what causes uh, pattern hair loss or thinning uh, with age. 
So um, what treatments are currently available for pain okay, with cut? So there, there are a number of treatments that are out there that are licensed for patterned hair loss. Mm. Uh, I suppose there are two other things that we need to know about. So our hair has a growth cycle that's normally measured in years. And we mm. know in patterned hair loss that growth cycle becomes much shorter. Okay. So one of the strategies is to use a product that will make that growth cycle longer okay. again. Uh, and minoxidil, which is available in a, a lotion or a mm -hmm. foam, does exactly that. So it pushes your hair back into the growth phase and keeps it in that anagen growth phase for as long as you carry on using it. So you've got to keep using it long term. Mm. The other thing that goes on, particularly in men, is that there is too much dihydrotestosterone around the follicle or around the, the hair bulb or there's too much sensitivity actually. The DHT is not necessarily elevated, it's just your follicles have become super sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. So one of the other strategies, particularly in men, is to decrease the amount of DHT. And you can do that mm -hmm. by using uh, an enzyme inhibitor uh, that stops DHT being created. So those are the kind of two strategies. Mm -hmm. um, the drug that is licensed uh, for men is called Propecia, uh, which is finasteride, uh, mm -hmm. one milligram dose, um, which is taken once a day. Uh, so those are the two licensed treatments, Minox still licensed for men and women, mm. and uh, Finasteride, a one milligram dose, licensed for men. And um, are there any other options if you don't want to use those? Uh, yes, there are, there are always lots of options. Um, they may have less good evidence behind mm. them. Uh, some people will use Saul Palmetto, which is a botanical that is a little bit like Finasteride, but maybe less potent. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of things around the fringes. Uh, so people have been using a lot of low-level laser light devices now, and we're starting to see more consistent results. I think the evidence is not as good as minoxidil and finasteride, right. but the trend of it helping hair seems to be there mm. uh, for, for some people. Uh, and I think you just gotta be a little bit cautious on that, but uh, these are devices you buy yourself mm. uh, and then use every other day or so for half an hour. Um, People are, are injecting vitamins or can inject your own blood. So you can have your blood extracted, spun down to just get the platelet pit yeah. bit, and that can be re-injected into your scalp. So there are lots of other things. Yeah. Um, there's a prostaglandin analog, which is used for glaucoma. Those uh, mm. it comes in drops. They also promote hair growth. So that's been looked at as a, a future treatment. Mm. So there are, and there's lots of other things out there. Mm. The big extra thing for pattern hair loss is surgical transplantation. Mm. So you can take hair from the back of your head, which is hair that we think of as not being under hormone control, mm. and put it to areas where we're very thin. Uh, so over the top of our head, or in women normally concentrating on the front. Mm. Uh, and those hairs still think they're at the back of your head and they keep growing. Mm. So surgical transplantation is at the, the other end uh, of the treatment options. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, Paul. Pleasure. So I'm here at the British Hair and Nail Society's Hair Educational Session in Glasgow, speaking with Dr. Manjit Kaur. Um, I have three questions for you, Dr. Manjit. Uh, the first is, what are the causes of hair loss? So there are various causes of hair loss. Mm -hmm. um, one way to classify these mm -hmm. is into those diseases which actually affect the hair follicle. Mm -hmm. They can either result in permanent or temporary hair loss. Yeah. Often this presents with reduced hair density or patchy hair loss. Mm -hmm. um, we can also see lots of diseases that actually affect the hair shaft. Mm -hmm. uh, these can result in fragility or d uh, inability for the hair to grow or mm -hmm. changing texture or comability or manageability of the hair. These yeah. are really important in children actually where they can be associated with an underlying genetic disease. Yeah. And then finally, the last group is those diseases which actually affect the hair cycle, mm -hmm. either the proportion of time spent in each phase or the synchronicity. Yeah. And these diseases include um, telogen effluvium or shock hair loss. Uh -huh. um, so do you think hair loss is important? I think hair loss is hugely important. I think hair forms part of our sort of self-identity. Mm -hmm. um, if hair is not good, it affects our self-esteem. Yeah. Um, in women, it's important for sexuality and femininity. Yeah. Um, and I think that when patients lose their hair or have a hair or scalp disease, it can have a profound psychological impact on them. Um, and sometimes they can have scalp symptoms as well, which can be very disabling and really depressing. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that hair loss and hair diseases result in reduced quality of life. Mm -hmm. And patients who suffer with these can have a higher incidence of anxiety and depression. Yeah. So absolutely I do. And um, who would you say is the best person for a patient to see who is suffering from hair loss? 
Well, I think dermatologists are probably best placed to see patients with hair loss, particularly those with a special interest in hair disease. Yeah. And that's particularly if the, the GP hasn't been able to help. Yeah. I think we're best placed in assessing hair loss thoroughly. Uh -huh. We, you know, would take a thorough history examination, use tools like trichoscopy, yeah. and we have a range of investigations we can do: blood tests, skin biopsies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think dermatologists would be the best.